Oh, there we go. I think the music's on now or the sound. Can you hear me? Okay, please uh, throw it up in the chat if you can. Welcome. Glad to see you. We'll, uh, we'll get started right away. Just uh, make sure you can hear me. So if you don't mind, just throw into the chat feed that you can hear me. Also, just to draw your attention to it, not sure if you already have this or not, but for those of you who are tuning in for the first time or new, uh, you may not have seen this. And cool. Thanks, Kyle. And um, the link there will take you to the Kindle version of Digital Sense, uh, the book that I co-authored with Travis Wright. It's going to be um, overkill as far as the whole thing, but you'll see the reference chapter around the insights layer that we're talking about today. So um, so if you don't have it, you can click on that link uh, in the chat um, under my welcome message and download that PDF, and it's the full uh, text. Um, so you don't have to buy it if you don't want to. Feel free to buy it. I don't even know what I make. I think 80 cents a, a, a copy or something, so it's not that big of a deal, but it does help the, uh, the track record. Anyway, uh, let's dive right in. So Insights Layer, hopefully you guys are warming up there. Looks like last week was pretty freezing uh, cold, but today you've got some nice uh, sun and warming weather. So thanks for tuning in on time, and uh, feel free again. Um, you know, I'm always starving for interaction from you because I want to uh, make this as relevant as possible. So don't be shy. We're getting to know each other better each and every time. For those of you who are new, um, just pretend like you know me. I can't see you. You can see me. So uh, anyway, just tell me how we're doing. Um, tell me how you're doing. Questions, things top of your mind, even if they're off topic. Because, again, these sessions are really about us getting to know each other, you getting to know me, and, and you guys getting some value as part of this whole audition process. Uh, before it's all formalized in uh, the spring semester. So, um, you know, we're underway, and, and feel free to just let me know uh, what's on your mind so that I can be as relevant as possible. We're going to shift gears a little bit like we did last week and um, talk about the organizational stuff. But as it relates to – now, you can look at this and use this a lot of different ways. So, uh, you know, in the book specifically, which was focused on the marketing and customer experience domains – we talked about it uh, as part of what we call the experience marketing framework. Um, this is a framework that we've applied in organizations and in, in investment analysis and a lot of things. So essentially, it's got several different names uh, depending on the, the flavor um, that we're packaging it in the direction and some of the notes change. But for the most part, the insights layer is, um, is pretty straightforward and always universal. So when we talk about insights, we're, we're talking not just about the aha moment like, oh, I should be doing this or maybe the customer wants that or maybe this industry or this thing is taking off or going down, whatever it may be. But what are the inputs to that aha moment? In other words, how can we trust them? How do we verify them? Where do we look to validate or uh, disprove our, our hypothesis um, so that we can ultimately eliminate all the reasons to say no to a decision. And that's the way to think about it is how can I eliminate all the reasons to say no? First, can I? Um, and then assuming that I can, how have I created some certainty around that for myself? And so this is a model that uh, you'll, you'll use um, hopefully a long time to help you do that. So we're going to talk about the insights layer, which is kind of when you first – start to get um, clarity around there might be a there there. There's something uh, to dive deeper into. You haven't formed a strategy around it yet. You haven't invested any real resources, deep resources into it yet. But this is a good way to bucket our thinking around these different things that sometimes are hard to connect the dots on and, um, and, and have a place to put these things so that we can ultimately cultivate better insights and then decide what we're going to invest in building a strategy around and then put resources to and, and ultimately execute, which is when you go up stack uh, through the vision layer and through the success layer, uh, which we'll get to in future weeks. But anyway, any um, anything you want to throw at me in the chat, uh, guys, before we get started? Otherwise, I'm just going to go on a rant. So 30 seconds, 20 seconds. Um, I'm stalling, doing a little time here just in case you – have something you are dying to, you know, put on my brain. If not, I'm going to fly in. So let's talk about uh, how this is organized. So as you can see here, we've got customers on the top node of this triangle. <clears throat> and essentially, if you were thinking about this three-dimensionally, if you haven't had a chance yet to um, read any of the book, the, the framework would look like this three-dimensionally. 
And so you'd have the insights layer here, the vision layer here, the success layer here kind of going up. And then as we talk about the loops, you'd have the horizontal loop um, going here, which we call the operational loop. And then this is the innovation loop here. So we'll just get a little sloppy with our handwriting. This is the innovation loop running vertical down through these three layers. So what we're looking at is kind of a, a cross section of, of um, the insights layer on the bottom, on the base layer. So think about it like the basement. Um, so on that, we've got these three, these three nodes, right? So we've got customer node, we've got uh, competitor node or competition, and then we've got what I call forces. So um, you can apply this however you're looking at. Like, it, let's say you're looking to get in a job in a certain industry, whatever that industry may be. Um, or you're looking at making an investment at some point or starting a business at some point. You would use this differently. So I'm going to kind of pick a couple use cases. But um, let's just say I was looking at an industry or, or going to work for a specific organization. That might be the most relevant one uh, as far as, you know, career goes. So let's say I was looking at, you know, I was in an industry, I had my education, I'm uh, thinking about, you know, joining one company versus the other, and I've kind of done these other assessments, but what I really want to know is, like, how suited for the future that Chris believes, which, again, I may not be right, but, um, you know, I'm trying to disprove myself every day. I fundamentally believe that, that the future of, of sustainable companies will be companies that have put the customer in the center of all decision making, the customer in the center of the business, meaning they've operationalized that. Now, happy to have a debate or an argument around that doesn't mean that I certainly don't know everything. Um, but the the last you know fifty to hundred years in the industrial age is really about product centric organizations where you know we invented some new thing, and then the business model and all the decisions were based on how we're going to push and then ultimately maybe pull that product through a distribution channel. And so we spent money and we built brand and we built awareness and, and um, you know, we advertised and we marketed and we pushed, push, 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 push to kind of make Nike or McDonald's or whatever the thing and make distributors that were looking for a product that would pull through or that would have awareness and, and demand that would, would make them want to buy from us. And then ultimately the customer was their asset. We were just pushing the product. They were our customer. So B2B to C type of stuff. So a lot of businesses and a lot of brands today have built, you know, over the last 50, 60 years, especially the legacy brands, around a product-centric business model, right? Which products do I kill? Which ones do I invest in? Which ones do I innovate? Do I add on to? Um, but when we talk about a uh, customer-centric business model and we're thinking about insights about what is our future going to look like or what is the future of this company we may want to go work for, meaning are they going to be in business or are they going to be a good place to work, a competitive place to work? Um, a compensation uh, equivalent place to work for me, meaning law of compensation. I can go make as much as I want and have the lifestyle that I want and those kind of things there and, and whatever you're looking to do. Um, the first thing you do is like, who is their customer? No, I wouldn't go out and ask them that. You could ask them that, but you could probably find this out. Like, what problem are they solving? So the question that I like to tell companies and, and C-level and those kind of things is, Everything should start with who do we exist to serve, who do we exist to serve, and why. Why? So customer need, I'm going to write that in green, actually, just so it stands up. So customer need. And why do I write need? Well, that's actually not that great, so I'm going to keep it in black. It's always hard to tell when you're not looking at the camera and you're right. So customer need. So the top three customer needs that company XYZ, ABC, your company, whatever it is, your solution, what are the top three customer needs that exist in a marketplace? Remember, back to law of compensation uh, the last two weeks, the need for what we do, our ability to do it. So if we're, if we're tying this stuff together, you know, it's, I've never done it this way before, so I love this because I've actually never – I uh, explained it this way, but it's it's perfect. I should have done this in, in the book. This would have been like version 2.0. So the need over here would be the ability, right? So here's need. Here's the ability. And here's replaceability. 
I still don't know if that's actually a word, but I made it one. So if we go back to law of compensation again, now we're taking the experience organization framework, the experience marketing framework, and we're, and we're evaluating and we're gaining insights at this layer, doing research around the need, the ability, and the replaceability. So tying this future value, this future compensation ability um, through an insights layer that says, what is, who is our customer? So first we say who, right? Who is the customer? Then we say, what needs are we filling for them, right? What do they need? Because they're no longer loyal to brand for brand sake. They are now loyal to their need, very personal, their need. You are loyal to your need in the moment that you have it. For instance, say you want to buy a, say you want to buy a new computer. Just thinking of something random. The first thing you're going to do is maybe you have a favorite brand, Dell, Apple, whatever it may be, right? So you're going to go and you're going to know there's certain places you can buy that computer. But what most people do is is depend, they, they go, okay, what do I need? Well, I need a new computer. Well, why do I need it? Well, I need it because my last one just crashed on me or just died. When do I need it? Well, I need it tomorrow or I need it, you know, two days from now. But I can't have it, you know, more than two days. I can't be without it, you know, more than two days. So the loyalty may be like maybe I'm loyal to Mac. Like no matter what, I'm going to buy the Mac. But whether I buy it from Apple.com or whether I pull that through, uh, you know, Amazon or wherever, meaning whoever gets that transaction and the associated data of mine with that transaction is going to be based on how they can fulfill my need in that moment. So if Amazon can get me the same computer for basically the same price but ship it to my door today because I'm a Prime member, guess who's going to get that sale? They are. So my loyalty goes to Amazon. Now, for all of a sudden, I'm finding something maybe isn't a MacBook. Maybe it's not as – and they don't have it or they have it, but they can't get it to me in time or it's only available through third-party marketplace sellers and I find it, you know, at the Target and I can order it now and go pick it up on my way to pick my kid up at school. Target gets that sale. So – Whoever the, you know, Walmart might get that sale. Whoever the retailer is. So, again, they're omni-channel presence. They're different things. They're, my loyalty is to the need being filled in a moment that I have it. So the first thing we have to do is who's the customer, what do they need, and then rank those top three needs, right? So whatever they are, it doesn't matter. We're going to just try and fill in what we think their top three needs are. And we're going to keep it to three because it's, harder, it's hard enough to do one thing really well. Um, but as an organization or even as an individual, tackling more than three things with any kind of focus in a shorter period of time, not humanly possible. We love to convince ourselves that we can multitask. The reality is um, we're deluding ourselves, right? We, we can do something well when we focus on it. So we're going to – plus we also want to know where should we invest our time and energy. Like this is about insights. So what are the top needs? And if we're not filling their top needs, like let's say that the needs we currently fill really would rank number four and five – but these are the three needs. Well, if we're vacant, meaning we don't have a solution or a product that solves these top three needs, we're an afterthought. So it might be time to, as an insight, start to move towards divesting or moving away from investing into these two needs, even though they've served us this long and maybe driven our core revenue. And we have to start building product and building something that's customer focused, that's customer centric. This is where we need to go next, right? This is, this is the solution we need to invest in. And bring a market so we can live on these but we can't live on these forever and so these are the insights right so that's how you would use customer note so that's the need now competitive um, this is both from a marketing standpoint but also from a delivery standpoint right so if we think about competition we can think about who is our direct so these are the things to be thinking about here direct and indirect Competition. Who are the three people that are setting the expectations for my customer in how they take delivery of any service, let alone my service? So we want to list our top maybe industry competitors or we want to assess, like, again, if we're going to work for a company or we're thinking about it, someone's making us a job offer and we want to know whether it's competitive um, or how long we might be there, right? In other words, is this just a stepping stone? I'm going to take it because I need a job and this is in my field now. Okay, but am I going to be here for a long time or not? Well, I don't know, but I, what I can start to do is predict that, right? Because I can say, well, 
what are these guys doing as it relates to their competition, their direct competition and everything else? Um, but the indirect competition here, because the direct competition is pretty easy, right? Target competes with Walmart, competes with Amazon. Like you can sit there and go, okay, who do they compete with? Um, University of Wyoming competes with uh, Colorado State. They compete with whatever other, you know, Division I um, good universities are within the Rocky Mountain region for local and maybe uh, migrating incoming students, right? So if I was working in a university, I'd go, well, who do we compete with? If I was working for an oil and gas company, I'd say, okay, well, Sinclair versus, who, you know, like who are the companies that uh, that I compete with? If one has a monopoly, well, then I say, okay, well, then what's the, who's level setting um the expectation of, of the customer, right? And now it's hard in B2B and B2G, it might be a little difficult, but in, in consumer or even in business to business, right, the, the expectation of what I am going to receive may not be set directly by me. For instance, if you've ever gotten in an Uber or a Lyft or any ride sharing company um, versus a taxi, a taxi competes with ride sharing companies directly and vice versa. And so they're going to compete on price, they're going to compete on service, their timing, all that stuff. But we all, if we're in e-commerce, if we are, if we're in retail, especially like if we're in the retail business or what have you, anything that requires payment from an end user, we technically indirectly compete with Uber and people like that because right now, depending on our payment system, if we require our customer to pull out their credit card wait to have it swiped, have it returned to, to sign and fill and complete. That is a friction point that forever has been okay and just part of the process. But for anyone who's now taken an Uber or a Lyft or checked out without having to do anything just by getting out and have that transaction automatically occur, right? Because it's contactless and, and doesn't require any me to do anything. The expectation, even though it may not be something that kills me today, because obviously that's not going to stop somebody from purchasing in a restaurant or whatever today, but the point is the expectation is being set by someone who's not in my industry. And ultimately, that from a customer experience standpoint, that can, um, that can be opportunity or that could be a threat down the road. So, again, just trying to understand who is setting the expectations of my customer. My direct competitors, who are they setting it? And then also my indirect competitors. The other thing that you would look at here from a marketing standpoint, keep this in the screen. This is a sloppy line, but there's a thing called the buyer's journey or you'll, if you Google this, you'll find more resources than ever. Um, a lot of firms tried to charge a lot of money to do this, but customer journey, well, that's really small. So customer journey is what that's. The journey talks about, and this is whether it's B2B, B2C, whatever it is, talks about the quote unquote touch point to when we the um, vision layer. This talks about the time from when I become aware, right? Awareness, ah, I need a new computer, or ah, I'm hungry, or ah, I need a coffee, right? To my loyalty and repurchase or revisit uh, of that brand, right? So in here, there's a bunch of different opportunities where that customer, or that prospect is going to interact with this company, my brand. Example, I need a coffee. Okay, well, you can't see it, but within you know three blocks of my office, uh, there's I think four or five coffee shops. Right now, I know that, but let's say I wasn't new. Let's say I wasn't from this town, right? Um, and I was just you know happening to be here for the day, and I was working in the hotel across the street or something like that, and I was like, man, I need a coffee. Typically, the first touch point just as an example, would be I would go coffee into Google and it would probably say near me and I would hit yes, right? And so a touch point mobile search. And then what would happen is I would select something, whatever it was, option A, B, or C. And when I select something, a couple things are gonna happen. I'm gonna get that site right away. Maybe it's gonna have an address and immediately bring up Google Maps or Apple Maps and take me, like, start walking right, right? It, like it could be that smooth or what might happen is I might get a spinning wheel because their mobile page load speed hasn't been optimized because they're a small business and they haven't thought about it, right? And, and as a consumer, again, coffee, need, now, right? I'm going to hit back and then I'm going to go to the next listing. And if that's Starbucks or if that's whatever and that's faster, 
guess who gets my two, four, four, five, six dollars, whatever that is, right? So the customer journey looks at that. Now let's say I get the coffee and it tastes great. Let's say I get the coffee, but the experience was bad. Let's say I get the, like all these different touch points. It's, it's good, it's bad, there's no milk in the thing, the sugar area was a mess, or it was clean, or they had really loud music, or maybe it was great music, and maybe it was good ambiance, and the Wi-Fi was awesome, and whatever, all these different things, right? That determines whether I'm in that market again, whether I refer, whether I come back, whether I revisit, whether I repurchase. So again, competition, direct and indirect, who sets the expectations, and then ultimately start thinking about um, the customer journey. Right, and are there any identifiable weaknesses that are like glaringly obvious that I don't even have to do research on? They go, wow, that sucks, or that's not current, right, for the customer, and what their actions are going to be. So, um, when we talk about customer needs, the last piece, and then we're going to shift gears into some exercises you can do to evaluate things, right? So you got competition, you got customer needs, and then you're going to look at things that deal with replaceability. So the things that deal with replaceability are what I like to call forces. Now, there's all kinds of forces. You can read about these in the books. Um, by the way, uh, just when you get a chance, let me know. You can still hear me loud and clear. I, I saw Kyle's message and Flint and you guys earlier, um, but just, just making sure we haven't lost sound or signal or anything. So uh, forces. And feel free to throw a question or two in here. We've given you enough content now where if you have a question, type one in. All right, so forces can be what I call macroeconomic forces. They could be technological. I'm just going to list a couple. They could be legislative, right? They could be acts of God, weather, things like that, right? They could be um, local, market. So just a short list, things to think about, right? They could be socioeconomic, they could be, um, they could be human related, capital, human capital related, right? Like shortage of talent, things like that, or a excess supply of talent in a market. Um, so these are, these are forces. And really these are just buckets, right? So you're going, what are the things that could affect? So if you think about what, ex what affects my ability to optimize customer experience, which means ultimately optimize my market share in the market over a period of time in a sustainable way, which means ultimately what drives my compensation, both as an individual and also as this firm, or as a potential person of this firm or owner of this firm, what is driving our value up or down, right? Well, one of those things is in our control, which means like we can, we can clarify and and contribute to what, how we treat our customer, right? How we empathize with them, how we focus on it, how we deliver solutions that are relevant to them. That piece we can control. We can't control what our competitors do. We can react to it. We can't control what forces do. We can prepare for them. So, so these two are kind of directly out of our control, but we need to be aware of them because they impact us. These ones are, this one's kind of in our control. Now we can't, you know, we can't make our customer need something. Uh, well, we could, but but not all the time, right? So the um, point is, is that, you know, kind of in my direct control, out of my direct control, but something that can impact me. So categorizing things, like if I, if I notice that, you know, blockchain is taking off, well, how early is it? How timing is it? Uh, you know, is it, is, it, is it hype cycle? Is it in the trough of disillusionment? Is it, you know, right now? Like what, how, how much of a threat really is it if I'm a bank or if I'm this or if I'm that, right? Legislative forces, um, you know, what are those, like laws being passed, you know, taxes, different things like that. How are they going to impact capital reinvestment in my industry? Um, are they going to incentivize it? Are they going to disincentivize it? Uh, you know, local market forces. Oh, XYZ just moved out of town or ABC just moved into town, bringing X amount of jobs. Well, that might have an impact on real estate and that might have an impact on this, positively, negatively, what happened. Right, so you just start to bucket. What are the forces? It's, it's truly like being aware of your surroundings. Um, so thank you, I'm, I'm just looking at the chat. Any questions so far? So we got customer need, competitors, forces. It's how we cultivate insights. Any questions on that? 
let you type something in if you have one. I'm going to erase a little bit of this, and I'm going to talk about an exercise that you can start to do or that you would do if you were trying to understand customer need. So how do I really know customer need? Well, there's a big, let's see, where's a good place to put this? I'm going to put, uh, all right, so we're going to go big, Eh, that's no good. So we're going to go big E-M-P-A-T-H-Y. Empathy, right? So there's a thing called empathy mapping. Now, empathy mapping is a fun little exercise that you would do with a cross-functional team. I say cross-functional not to create another big word. But to say, so I might have someone from marketing, I'd have someone from operations, maybe I have someone from customer service, call center, something like that. Again, I'm just giving you examples. If it's a founding team, I've got my technical person, I've got my sales guy or girl, and I've got you know my product person, like whatever my, small or large, I just want someone other than me. Right? Someone with a different vantage point of the customer than me. Maybe I have delivery, maybe I have like whatever it is, uh, manufacturing, supply chain, who, whoever it is, I need a cross-functional team because they're looking at the day-to-day -day, um, from a different lens than, than the other person. And so they may not interface in their mind. They may not interface with the customer ever, right? They may be a cog in the wheel in their mind. But that cog in the wheel ultimately impacts customer experience at some point. Because if it's fast, then it's making it better. If it's reliable, then it's making it better. If it's slow, if it's the weak link, if it's um, got a bad, you know, leader and and toxic culture inside that little division and you know fiefdom, then it's ultimately going to have a negative uh, impact somewhere down the road on that customer experience, right? So the first thing I do is I get a cross-functional group, which is basically me plus maybe one, two, three, four other people. Never more than seven. Seven is heaven. Eight is not great type of thing. So, you know, one to uh, two to seven people that care about what I'm trying to do. Or I have to imagine friends if I'm just looking at it by myself and I try and put my brain into what it would be like to be in the ops or the supply chain of management, but that's a little harder. Think, feel, Say, do. Think, feel, say, do. You take a whiteboard, and this is not the scale. I would use this whole board, right? I'd literally go, whoosh, and then all the way across. Or I would take a flip chart, like you've probably got, see, see how we have flip charts right here, right? And what I would do is I'd hand out four different color Post-its. So I'm just showing you how you would do this as an exercise. Four color post-it. Super cheap, super easy. I'd give a stack of five to ten red, five to ten pink, five to ten orange, five to ten yellow, whatever the four colors are. It doesn't matter. Right? Different colors. And I would assign a color to each one of these things. And the first thing I would do is say something like coffee. Right? Again, I'm going to use coffee in this example. We would use a real world thing like if we were selling computers, if we were selling software, if we are whatever we were doing, I'd say, hey, as it relates to our problem or our solution to a problem, when someone is aware, when a customer becomes aware that they need a solution for this problem, what do they think? So, for instance, simple something that everybody maybe can understand, I'm tired. So I have this problem called it's the middle of the day, 2 o'clock, and I feel a little tired. I'm dragging ass. What do I think? And I would write down, I would have everybody write down, what do you think on the, quote, yellow post-it? So they would say, I think I feel tired. And they say, wait, you used the word feel. Yeah. So how do you feel? I feel tired. Okay. How do you feel, Bob? I feel sluggish. I don't know what the word would be, but it, most people might use the word tired. What do you feel? I feel 
bored. I feel overwhelmed, right? I need a break. So what do you think? Well, I think I need a break. I think I need a break. What do you say? They're going to say something. They might say, I need a break. Right? They might say, you want to grab a coffee? And I would have them write down exactly what they would say. You want to grab a coffee? Right? Or you want to take a walk? You want to get some air? People will say different things when they think they need a break or when they think they need a pick-me-up, whatever it may be. So because everyone will associate to it similarly but differently, the value of this exercise is your empathy mapping. You're personalizing this. You're humanizing the need in real words, in real thoughts, because everyone's going to say, well, what do you think? Well, I think it's time for a break. Great. What do you feel? I feel tired. I feel sluggish. I feel bored. I feel overwhelmed. I feel stuck. I feel stagnant. I feel whatever they're going to say. They're going to write these words down, and boom, you're going to stick them in that quadrant, right? And what do you say when you feel tired? I, I say I need a coffee. Okay, or I want a coffee. Different, right? Need, want, whatever. All It has to be that specific. I want a coffee. Uh, you want to take a walk. You want to grab a coffee. You, you want to take a break. You want to get some fresh air. What do you do? I search, if I'm not local, right? I search for coffee on my mobile phone. What do you do? I walk to my favorite place, right? Whatever it is. Simple example, but showing you how you do empathy mapping. What's the point of empathy mapping? The point is, is that human beings don't respond to tactics. They respond to what feels human. Sure, they might click on your mobile ad. They might click on your keyword optimized, you know, Google strategy. That doesn't mean they feel like you know them. That doesn't feel, that doesn't feel human, right? That feels very quant. Nothing wrong with quant, but customer experience, this notion of customer centric has to do with being human to human in everything we do, even if we're using technology and tools. So that's the insight layer. That's an exercise you'd pull from the insight layer. Um, any questions on that? We're going to keep today high and tight, 35 minutes, 33 minutes, whatever we're at. Any questions on that? Comments? Do you like that one? Yeah? Cool. I'm setting up a uh, playlist on YouTube that's private. Um, I'll um, let you guys know when it's ready. I'm putting kind of the replays. I'm assuming you're getting the replays in your inbox because you should be getting that. If you're not, uh, email me, please, and let me know if you're not getting the replays if you want them. If not, what I'm doing is I'm um, creating uh, these as recurring lessons. Feel free to share them. Again, my call to action would be let's get more of you on uh, this is an open enrollment kind of thing. So obviously the more you give, the more you get. We've talked about that for those of you who've been around, but for those of you who this is your first time, you know, there's no catching up. There's no, you know, behind, there's no like, you know, we're, we're using this time. Um, oh, uh, good. I'll answer that question. And then we'll wrap there. Um, I just saw one come in. So what do you use empathy mapping for? The, the thing you would use empathy, empathy mapping for is to get, a really human idea of what these needs are, but then how your customer actually thinks, feels, says, and do. What are the thinking, feeling, saying, and doing actions that they actually do when they have that need? Because when you start to do things like messaging, positioning, um, communicating the brand, communicating the the value proposition. So this is everything from your sales material to the language you use on your website to the keywords you optimize to everything in between, right? It, it's really, when you've empathy mapped, you've actually said, how does a person react when they have the need? So if I can identify what the top need is, that's great. But what do they think about it? Well, they think this. Okay, great. So if I could create a marketing piece or if I could create a messaging piece that used that word or, you, or, or implied that feeling, they're going to think it was made exactly for them because it actually was.
So that's what you'd use it for, is to personalize the messaging, to um, highlight the features and the aspects of the product in a way that is human. Good question. All right, guys, that's it for this week. We'll see you next Tuesday. Enjoy. Send me emails if you have any questions offline.